Last time on Building Resilience, we were whacking a wall with a stapler. Before that, we were covering a naked house with a self-adhered HydroGap weather-resistive barrier and flashing windows with HydroFlash LA. Both of those are from Benjamin Obdike. Because the adhesive is acrylic, it's easy to pull back and reposition HydroGap. The crew sticks the top to the line and patiently smooths the rest out. When the top section seems good, they peel off the lower release sheet and work the HydroGap into place. Peel and Stick WRB is great for flashing penetrations, and so is the blue HydroFlash LA. Between the two, this wall ain't ever gonna leak. This week we're discovering the pitfalls of digging holes in Minneapolis during winter. Ugh. We're also going to get after the framing portion of this stylish backyard shed, beginning with mud sills and wall framing. To locate the foundation bolts efficiently, Michael measures locations and dictates the numbers to Joseph, who lays them out at the cut station. With the distance numbers reconciled, he specifies the distance from the edge of the plate. Joseph marks those and cuts the holes. Then, they plop the mud sills in place. When they're all cut to fit, Joseph marks their position, and then they pull them up and set them aside so they can deal with the capillary break and to pre-plug some air leaks. That process begins with sweeping off the foundation so the HydroFlash LA will have something to stick to. This is part of a unique solution to a unique condition. We have a, a unique condition, and so we had to come up with what a kind of a unique solution. Uh, we are gonna be hanging our framing off of the foundation here. Uh, and so we wanted to do a couple of things. We wanna protect the wood from the masonry, that's the capillary break, both at the ends of the framing and the bottom plate. We also wanna think about termites. We don't have them in the north yet, but they're, they're coming. Uh, so how can we put a termite shield in there but that will protect our wood framing and then also because we're putting two inches of insulation and sheeting on the outside, we want to make sure that this extends far enough out that it's going to protect the underside of that foam and sheeting as well. So we have this relatively simple shape that we've come up with. This face is going to protect the framing from the masonry. This face is going to protect our bottom plate from the masonry. And then it's got this an extension and a little hem dripped edge uh, for shed outside. On top of the foundation, we're gonna lay two beads of Benjamin Obdike's HydroFlash LA. Uh, this is the blue goo, it's a liquid applied flashing, and that's gonna give us a nice air seal underneath that metal as well. It'll also provide a great air seal on top of the metal where it'll bed the mud sill into the flashing. Just make sure to locate the two beads within the footprint of the mud sill. And squirt the bolt holes too. The sill snuggles into its little bed and Stephen bolts it down. While Michael stacks the floor, we're gonna visit the wall crew who's standing walls, snapping lines, and cutting wood. And nailing wall sheathing to the walls. This is called force field, as you can see on the face, and it's an OSB sheathing with a WRB laminated onto the face of it. The wall Joseph's sheathing now is tall, but it's not the tallest wall in this shed. The far wall clocks in at 13 feet tall, and there's more complexity to the wall construction than varying heights. There are four types of wall in this tiny little shed hut. The first wall type is a simple two by six wall framed 16 inches on center with a layer of force field sheathing on the outside. Just like what we saw Joseph nailing together, it's an uninsulated shed wall that doesn't face a property line. Force field sheets are nailed into the framing every six inches along the edges and 12 inches in the field. The sheets are gapped about an eighth inch or the thickness of a nail. The second wall type is a variation of the first with 2x6 framing and a layer of force field on the outside, but on this wall type we're going to sandwich 2 inches of styrofoam between the studs and the sheathing, and we're making those insulated wall panels on site. 
We're making our own insulated wall panels here. We've got DuPont's Zero GWP Styrofoam, two inches for R10, and we've glued that using Huber's subfloor adhesive to a uh, 7 16 OSB sheet from Georgia Pacific with their force field coating. And the reason that we're doing it this way is so that our nail base is on the outside. So we're gonna go framing, foam, and then we'll have a 7 16 nail base and pretty much every cladding out there uh, can be attached to a 7 16 wall sheeting. Wall type three is remarkably similar to wall type one. Two by six stud wall with force field sheathing applied directly to the studs, but with an extra layer of dense glass gold on the outside for fire protection. This is an uninsulated shed wall, but it faces the neighbor's shed, so because of its proximity to the property line, there must be a fire barrier. Wall four is similarly similar to wall two, the styrofoam sandwich, with an outer layer of dense glass gold also. Again, for fire protection and neighbor proximity. Now, there's one caveat to making foam sandwiches like this. You really need to seal the inside stud cavities. We're using spray foam, but you could use a sealant around the perimeter and then fill the cavity with other insulation. Just taping the face won't get you the air tightness due to the three-dimensional airflow network caused by building up these panels. But all of that gibberish doesn't mean we won't tape the seams, so we're gonna do that right now. Force field tape is an acrylic tape formulated for the force field facing, so you don't need to roll the tape or mash it into the substrate to make it stick for a long time. Georgia Pacific says that hand pressure is all that's needed. Window openings can be one of the leakiest parts of a wall because they're giant holes filled with glass. It's important to seal the edges of the hole against air leaks and to protect the framing against water leaks. We're doing the water part right now with a flexible flashing membrane on the window sill. After the flashing is set on the sill, it's formed around the corners. Here's another giant hole in the hole that will become a window. This gap where the framing meets the sheathing, the gap extends the perimeter of the window. That gap needs to be sealed back to the framing with something. We're gonna use force field tape, extending down to the sill flashing and folding into the opening. Now, the face of the sheathing is sealed to the framing with no leakage pathway on the sides, top, or bottom. One of the challenges with continuous exterior insulation, especially if it's thick, two inches or more, is what do you do at the corners? So there's a couple ways to solve this. Um, you can cut the foam back on one panel and run the other panel long, and then you have the OSB meeting OSB, and it's a little floaty, which is fine if you're doing corner boards that are of a decent width, but if you forget, or if you're doing something like vinyl siding or no, no corner trims, you're gonna want a piece of solid blocking in there. In this case, just a two by four ripped down to two inches, foam cut back out of this panel, and then attached to the framing. And you can see now we have a very solid nail base. Let's take a closer look at what he just said. We have a wall with force field and foam on. And we have another wall, just like it, sitting perpendicular. What happens when we make them into a corner? there is five and a half inches of uninsulated stud visible. To solve that, the insulated panel would have to be shifted over, which means that you need to consider this when laying out the studs in the first place. But that doesn't solve the issue that Michael was talking about. The fact that the foam is terrible at holding nails or screws from a corner board. For small corners, like those for vinyl siding, you need to provide some backing for the fasteners. Cutting the foam back and slipping in some solid lumber will do the trick. Speaking of corners, we usually tape the corners, but sometimes, you know, the, there's too many nails on one side or the other, or the tape's not wide enough. One of the things that GP did that I think is pretty cool is that they've included a corner detail with their, with their system. So this is their corner seal product, and it comes out in a roll like this. You bend it, and it looks a lot like a drywall bead, the way you might mud up a corner, except that in this case, you just have to put a piece of tape on it, and now you've got a weather-tight connection. With that corner piece on the wall, Michael tapes the edges to the force field facing and moves on to an inside corner, just to show that the strip works backwards too. You might have noticed that he didn't extend the corner all the way to the top of the wall. I think that was so he could demonstrate how to overlap them if needed, which is done like this, and then this. 
And that's about all there is to sealing up walls with an integrated WRB on the wall sheathing, like force field. Next week, we're gonna jump up on the roof and check out another sticky product, vapor dry self-adhered roofing membrane. It air seals and water seals a roof deck while allowing water vapor to dry outward. To make a roof assembly resilient to extreme weather events, they'll fold the lower row down over the subfascia to completely air seal that leaky framing connection. They do the same at the top of this shed roof, protecting the heck out of the roof edge from ice dams and sideways rain. And folding the vapor dry into the wall sheathing tightens the air barrier without trapping moisture. We'll install a bunch of that stuff next time on Building Resilience.